Hi everyone, sorry for the delay in getting you uh, the weekly recap video, but I was a little bit, um, I guess, perplexed as to what exactly uh, to give you to help you uh, continue to grow as historians and to grow in this class, but I think I've come up uh, with the perfect idea. So what I want to do is I want to start here on our uh, Canvas website, and I actually want to start uh, in a little bit of a backwards fashion from what I normally do. I'd like to start with your, uh, your assignments for this week, which as I noted in the announcement, uh, and in the lecture videos are slightly different uh, than I normally do. So if you open up your discussion uh, post, you're going to notice that I'm asking, actually asking you for two things. Uh, I'm asking you to do a primary source discussion and a weekly response uh, that count as one thing. So you actually only have to do uh, one assignment, but it's actually in two steps. Uh, so to tell you exactly what I mean, you really need to read uh, the directions that I provide for you here. And then you have to read these three uh, additional um, readings for the week that aren't mentioned in the syllabus. You should note uh, that you don't have to read the primary source that's outlined in the syllabus. There's too good of an opportunity to link our um, course material for this week with modern events. So I, I got rid of the primary source from, from W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, we've read a lot of Americans thus far in this world history class. So I want to push him to the side and focus on the Belgian Congo instead. Um, the first is this an opinion piece uh, from Hatter who is uh, discussing a little bit about why Confederate monuments in the United States are being taken down or torn down at this time. Um, so you can read that there. Remember, it's just an opinion piece. You don't have to agree with Hatter. Uh, you can disagree. The second is a news story coming out of Belgium, uh, European country, uh, from last week that directly relates to a statue related to the scramble for Africa, which was a major part of uh, lecture two and three uh, from this week and from your reading. So uh, please make sure to read that. And then the third piece is another piece of news coming out of the Democratic Repu uh, Republic of the Congo, uh, which it celebrated its 60th anniversary of independence last week. Uh, and the piece examines Congolese, Congolese leaders, uh, their responses to an apology that came from the Belgian uh, king. So I I'd like you to read those three pieces in addition to the lectures and your reading for this week. And ultimately, I want you to write three paragraphs. One, answering each one of these questions. Uh, why are people protesting statues of King Leopold II? Why is this similar to protests in the United States? So there actually are kind of right answers for this one. Normally I'm asking your opinion about things and I'm open to kind of different ideas, but there are actually some correct answers to questions one and two. You know, why do people protest Leopold II? Draw upon our readings, draw upon the lectures, uh, and you should have a pretty easy question for that. How is this similar to statue protests that are happening in the United States? I think that these three readings uh, that you're doing in addition to the textbook reading and the lecture watching will help you with that. And then the third part is an opinion piece. Uh, why, uh, what do you think should be done about problematic historic statues and why do you believe this approach is best? Now, please don't be Americentric here, right? This is a world history class. So think about problematic statues in a global sense. Sure, there are ones in the United States, but as we're learning, there are also problematic statues in Belgium. Uh, there are problems with memory of history in um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There are kind of similar debates going on around the world about uh, these same issues of memory and remembrance. So um, that third part is an opinion piece, but you want to think globally about this. You want to tie in some of our readings. Uh, you'll notice that I extended the final deadline for all of this to Saturday. July 11th at 5 p.m. instead of your normal Friday deadline, because in addition to writing these three paragraphs, I'm also going to check and see that you responded thoughtfully to at least one other classmate's post. Um, so this is a discussion post. So as we've done in the past with our primary sources, you can post and respond uh, to other people. So you're not only giving your three paragraphs, you're also responding. I think a paragraph suffices. If you'd like to write more, please feel free. But I think a paragraph response will suffice to uh, another student's response. So these are thoughtful responses, right? You can agree and explain why, you can politely disagree and explain why, or you can fall somewhere in between, maybe ask a question, uh, try to drive discussion forward. So your um, responses for this week are actually kind of twofold, right? You're writing these three paragraphs, but then you're also responding um, to what other people have written. I really look forward to reading both your responses uh, and your responses to other classmates. Uh, I'll be grading your three paragraphs just as I've done all of your other posts. But the discussion 
uh, responses, your response to someone else, which will count for your primary source discussion grade for the week. Uh, so long as you do that and do it well, this is an easy 10 out of 10 for everyone. So I will go through and read those, but because these are entirely your opinions, uh, whether you agree, disagree, or somewhere in between is up to you. So long as it's done well, um, you'll be receiving 10 out of 10s. That's an easy 10 out of 10 for the primary source, and the weekly response will be based on these three paragraphs. So that's what you're doing uh, for this week. A little pause and came back and edited it. Um, what, you're, what I want to do right now is give you a little bit of recap on how to do better in paper number one. You know, normally I do weekly recap videos, but week four seems so far away now that to give you advice on, on your responses there is probably not as useful as giving you advice on your first paper. So I'm hoping to get the second paper assignment done uh, sometime in the coming week or, or very shortly thereafter, giving you enough time. Um, the paper's not due until the last day of class. So the second paper giving you enough time to do that. It's going to be exactly the same. That is, I'm going to be asking you to look at some primary sources and to build an argument relating to a question based on those primary sources. The first thing you want to do uh, before you even watch the rest of this video is make sure you've gone back and read my comments on your first paper. When you submit your second paper, the first thing I'm going to do is go back and read your first paper and my comments to it to make sure you at least paid attention to what I told you to do. Uh, in order to improve. They're small comments, but uh, for some of you, that's all you need. For other people, you need a little bit more work, um, but starting there is really the best place to start. After you've read those comments, the next thing I would recommend doing is going here uh, to paper number one, uh, this sample that I've provided. One of your classmates has given me uh, the permission to post uh, paper number one, so you'll see here that I have the person's uh, paper. You'll notice that I also left in the comments I provided. Uh, for some of you, you'll be like, wow, that's a really similar comment to what I got on my paper. Uh, this is this is good because uh, a lot of you actually fell short in the same exact spot. And so uh, definitely read through the sample paper. I provided it because I'm not going to tell you the grade in case you figure out who this is, but they scored quite well uh, in the A range, although definitely room for improvement if you read my comments. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a step-by-step on what I believe that this student did in order to receive an A grade uh, for those of you who are interested in getting an A grade. And I'll give you some advice on how to think like a historian, how to argue like a historian, how to write like a historian for paper number two. So advice on how to do better for paper number two uh, with some brief PowerPoint slides. So if you're used to taking notes during PowerPoints, this might be another opportunity for you to take notes. Historians and history, how to think, argue, and write like a historian. So I really want to walk you through kind of the four suggestions I can make uh, to better uh, think, write, and argue like a historian in your second paper. Now, like I said, some of you have a lot of work to do, and you might be looking forward to that. Other people say, oh, you know, I don't have as much. Pick and choose from what I give you, uh, depending on your need, in order to improve for the second paper. So my first piece of advice is to engage your sources, and I'll walk through a little bit of what that means. My second piece of advice is to outline your argument. I think everyone in class could really benefit from this piece of advice. I didn't receive a, a, a perfect thesis in any of my papers. So uh, this one I would definitely pay attention to, outline your argument. Uh, the third piece, and another one that a lot of you, I'd say about 90% of you could benefit from, show, don't tell. And I'll explain you exactly what that means. And then proofread. Some of you did a great job proofreading, others I had to really kind of go in. And when I get bogged down proofreading, I can't pay attention to your arguments. Uh, and so uh, I'll walk you through that as well. So the primary sources, your second paper is going to ask you to do this as well. For the first paper, we were looking at the writings of Samuel Sewell. We were looking at a speech given by William Wilberforce and another speech given by Frederick Douglass. All three of them were anti-slavery, right? But what the paper asked you to do is explain how they were anti-slavery in different ways. And so when you read primary sources, and I'm actually going to spend a lot of time at the end of this video doing this, but when you read primary sources, you want to be paying attention to who's writing. You know, what are they writing, which was really the heart of this paper. All three of them, sure, they're different people, but that's going to happen with anything. But they were all writing the same thing in different ways. So the what for this question was incredibly important. Uh, the when could have been important too. Some of you really like to highlight that they were writing to different audiences. Sewell was a colonial New Englander who was making religious arguments to a religious um, group of people, Wilberforce, a politician talking to parliament, and Douglas, an American talking to Americans on the 4th of July. You know, that when is very important uh, and it connects to the who. The where for this question, really not that important. The reason I gave you these three is because they're all in English. 
I didn't want to give anyone sources that weren't in English and say, hey, you have to translate it. That would be totally unfair. And uh, my translating skills aren't good enough to do. I could do some French, but the Spanish uh, or anyone else would be moving beyond that. So the where isn't really that super important for this. They're all English. So they all either took place in the United States or in Great Britain or the, or the British colonies. But another thing that a lot of you didn't necessarily get to was the why, which is directly connected to the what here. Um, the arguments were made in different ways for a certain reason. So that why is very important. Consider who, what, when, where, and why when reading your primary sources. And I'll walk you through a little bit of that at the end. The argument, and I'm going to walk you through this in a sample too. But an argument is not a reiteration of the question. If your intro ends with, and in this essay, I'm going to tell you about how these arguments were made differently, period. That's not a thesis. That's a reiteration of the question or a reiteration of the prompt. Please don't do that. Be specific in what your argument is and provide your readers a roadmap to the rest of your essay. Show, don't tell. A lot of you could benefit from this too. In order to make an argument based on your sources, you want to quote that source. So use your sources. Show me quotes that explain the ideas you're getting across, right? Keep the kind of, keep to your roadmap. So move through your sources in a logical way, which a lot of you did. So not a lot of work to do there and provide proper citations. If you open with a quotation mark, you have to end with a quotation mark. Some of you would open with a quote, but then it would just kind of keep going for the rest of the, the paper. You have to close quotes. Uh, and this is kind of just a very simple uh, thing to do in order to make your paper more readable. Then finally, proofread. Find a friend to read your paper. They'll highlight what's wrong. Read it aloud to yourself. If you use Microsoft Word, there is a text to Word function. Your computer will read your paper to you. This is a very easy way to uh, proofread your paper. And then finally, check your tenses. So many of you uh, didn't write in the past tense. This is a history paper. Um, Samuel Sewell isn't arguing, he argued. Samuel Sewell has been dead for hundreds of years. Same with Frederick Douglass or William Wil Wilberforce. Past tense is important. Also subject verb agreement. If you have a plural subject, you need the plural verb tense. Little things like that are the difference between very strong papers and not so strong papers. So what have I done for you? I have written here an ideal introduction paragraph. And I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't proofread this yet. So now I just started to get uh, nervous. But hey, that's something I would go back and do. Let me read through it aloud so you can hear what I'm kind of looking for. Although forced labor and chattel slavery were central to the colonial process in the Americas, by the 17th century, all... I'm sorry, a small but influential anti-slavery movement was beginning. Building on the ideas of Enlightenment thinkers who argued that slavery was, quote, a violation of the natural rights of every person, anti-slavery advocates contended that slavery was not only unjust, but perhaps detrimental to the entire society. And I pulled that quote right from the textbook, page 710. But all anti-slavery voices were not the same. And even though some anti-slavery voices argued for abolition, very few argued for equality. This essay examines the anti-slavery propaganda of Samuel Sewell, William Wilberforce, and Frederick Douglass in order to demonstrate how different, how different these voices can be. Although all three argued against slavery, Sewell argued against religious justifications. Wilberforce used statistics to appeal to politicians, and Douglass drew from his own personal experience as an enslaved American to highlight the injustice of slavery in the land of the free. While all three were meant for different audiences, I found Douglas's argument to be the most convincing because of both his first-hand experience and due to the rhetorical tool of irony he used to appeal to American sense of patriotism. That's an introduction, right? I will highlight here for you the exact thesis section of this. But before that is a little bit of fluff. Everyone likes to give a nice little introduction, but this is my thesis, right? I've got it for you right here. And I perfectly explain how I'm going to set up my essay. I explain what the differences are, and then I'll build on this in my paragraphs. And you see my roadmap too, right? I'm going to go from Sewell and his religious arguments to Wilberforce as a politician to Douglas as a former enslaved person. Now, I've made those claims, but I need to back them up. That's where I go to my primary sources, right? I'm starting here with Sewell. Okay, uh, look, I'm going to pull this quote, Joseph was rightfully no more slave to his brethren than they were to him. Perfect. Here's a good quote. Copy and paste. Write a little bit about it. All right. Wilberforce. I said he was using a bunch of statistics. Ah, here we go. It will be found on average these ships evidence, you know, this kind of thing. Same with pulling from Douglas. 
You want to pull quotes in order to prove your point. I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, if you have questions for paper number two, email me.